life after football for me it was just a very, very lonely place. I had no career. I didn't know what direction to spin. I felt lost. I was in quicksand for a couple of years and I was not moving. When you go through life and you're playing football and that's all you do, and it was just like a dream come true. But you gotta have that 100% focus just in that sport. And then when it ends, it's very empty because now you're asking yourself, who am I? What direction do I go? I've been friends with Mark since uh, the spring of our senior year in high school. He's always been one that rises to the challenges that are put in front of him. For the last two years, he and I have been training for Everest. You know, I'm not going, but I'm with him every step of the way, and it's been amazing to watch him approach this challenge with the vigor that he's had. I started this journey to climb the seven summits was 10 years ago. The seven summits are the seven highest peaks on each continent. I've done six of the seven, and not only am I going to climb Mount Everest this year, but also take on Lhotse, the fourth highest mountain. The idea is to climb Mount Everest in the morning, get back down to Camp Four, and then go back up Lhotse. There's only a handful of people in the world who've ever actually done this. I'll be the oldest NFL player. I'm 59 years old right now. I don't feel it. The most important part of our training, and specifically Mark's training, is going uphill. And going uphill with weight on your back. Because that's what he's going to be doing every day for two months. Everest, you know, is the highest point on Earth, and it is the pinnacle of achievement for a lot of people. Everest alone is completely debilitating. It's all you can do to get yourself up and all you can do to get yourself down. And on top of that, Mark hopes to, after climbing Everest, climb Lhotse as well, which is the neighboring peak. It's like running two marathons in a row at right 29,000 feet. High altitude is not good for the human body. We refer to 8,000 meters and above as the death zones. And at that point, the human body is physically dying. Uh, we don't have enough oxygen to sustain life for very long. It's going about 60 miles per hour, on and off. We still have some steep rolls. If you make the wrong decision on Mount Everest, your body stays there forever. They don't bring you home. They don't send a search party up to, to rescue you. The wrong decisions result in death, not getting cut, not losing a game, the end of your life. So mentally you have to be prepared, and physically as well, to have the endurance at the end to do another climb. I didn't realize the healing the mountains and the effect that that would have on me. Being in all that peace, that serenity in nature gave me an opportunity to really think about life, think about where I'm going, think about the places that I've been to kind of put me in that particular position. I grew up in Seattle, Washington, a very mountainous community. And if you would have asked any of my, my buddies, you know, I was the guy always out there with the football in my hand. It rained all the time up in Seattle and it didn't matter. I was out there in a t-shirt playing pickup with whoever would, would show up. My dad, who's passed away since, was somebody who had grown up also climbing in the mountains. I was also blessed to be kind of in the presence of greatness of a lot of famous mountaineers around the world, Ed Veasters climbing up there, the Whitaker brothers. And so always been inspired by mountaineering, but my true love was always playing football.
When he had come into Washington, Mark had to sit for three years, and that's something he had never encountered. When I came to the University of Washington, I was six foot one, I was 181 pounds, I could not bench my weight, and I was pretty much a mess. He was a little bit of an undersized, underdeveloped wide receiver. You know, he was taking a little bit of a beating in practice. Those three years where he had to sit the bench, he transformed his body. By the time he got in the lineup, he was benching 350 pounds, and it showed in how he played. Patterson, touchdown! There was never any question in me, just knowing his character as I did, that he was going to go all in. I get drafted, and then that spring, they had a mini camp, and they called all the vets and all the new rookies. Jim Plunkett is the quarterback, Marcus Allen is the running back, Todd Christensen, Lester Hayes. I mean, there's all these superstars that I'd grown up watching on TV, and now I'm sitting there, and I said to myself, if I ever died, this is what heaven would be like. and then four <coughs> straight shot to the left foot. So, one, three, two, single, one, two, two more sets. Uh, I've been working with Mark about four months now. We've been sharpening his kinesthetic uh, awareness, his athleticism, and making him just more capable of dealing with the unstable environment that he's gonna encounter on Everest. Set, going, one, two, three, four, five. We've been introduced to hardcore fitness training, and it's just really incorporating six-dimensional moves. Rotate the bar at the bottom, come tall at the top. The whole workout is high tempo, non-stop, high intensity. That second hit is a little above your first hit. It's a very practical and functional down. type of strength training. You know, you're not static. It's not pushing weights, but it's moving your body in a way that you're gonna move it on the mountain. Typically, these climbers will lose 10% of their body weight. So knowing that he's gonna lose muscle mass, we're gonna send him over with as much functional muscle mass as we can, because we don't want his legs getting tired. So we do all these sets to max. So he's used to failing over and over again, and we keep pushing the boundary back of how much it takes to get him to fail. At the end of the day, I've done all this training, and I think I'm in pretty good shape, but I won't know till I actually get there. You know, there's a lot of accomplished mountaineers that are sitting up there that are no longer with us. In 2019, I was tent mates with a guy by the name of Don Cash. We were climbing in Antarctica on the mountain down there called Mount Vincent. And um, four months later, his goal was to go to Mount Everest. It was the year that we all saw those super long lines. And he got to the very top of the mountain. He raised his hand and fell over dead. And right now, he sits right now at the Hillary Step, you know, at about 28,500 feet. And, um, you know, I mean, it's just unfortunate. Uh, when I go up there, I most likely will be stepping over my tent mate. There are things that I've been collecting over the years now, the past eight, nine years, while I've been on this journey. Uh, every mountain requires something a little bit more. Right before I'm about to leave, I get butterflies. And it's the exact same feeling when I used to run out the Coliseum. My goal was to play 10 years in the NFL but I got cut. When you're an NFL player, you feel like you have a lot of purpose and there's a lot of notoriety and people identify you in a certain way. And then when it ends, you're 30 years old and you're like, okay, now what? I transitioned out of the NFL, got married and had two beautiful daughters. We're raising our kids and I'm coaching. And relationships, sometimes they just don't go in the same parallel track. 
My marriage was not working and I was in a beyond lonely place of feeling super stuck. It was really difficult for him watching his marriage untangled because he had high expectations for himself and he always wanted to be extraordinary and I think right at that time I think he was taking inventory of his life and he didn't feel that he was extraordinary. I felt so abandoned and so alone that I thought maybe I'd have more value being dead than alive. I didn't know if I'd make it past my 50th birthday. Unlike some people that just want to say I climbed the seven summits, Mark's reasons is very, very and deeply personal. And it all started with his divorce. I found the mountains because of this tough place I was in. And it was something that could take my focus off the negativity and put it towards a big ass goal. We're now up here about 13,000 feet and uh, all sorts of climbers and trekkers and guides here. The team is led by Garrett Madison. Garrett has been on top of Mount Everest 10 times. He's come over to Sun Valley and we've trained together. And it's comforting to me to not only get to know him better, but also understand what it takes to climb these big mountains. So the entire Everest expedition from start to finish is about two months. We arrive in Kathmandu at the beginning of April and fly into the Khumbu Valley. Spend about 10 days trekking up to Everest Base Camp. So we start off about 8,000 feet, and Base Camp's a little over 17,000 feet. Part of the reason why we do that 40 mile journey by foot is that we're trying to build red blood cells in our body to carry more oxygen around so that we can actually survive at 17,500 feet. Here we are at Everest Base Camp. There's all the boys in there right there. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> okay, now we're going to take a step down Prayer Lane. Yeah. Sid, how would you evaluate this particular tent? Not too bad. I would say it's a unique form of organization that is particular to mountain climbing. I'd like to show you Exhibit B. Okay. Exhibit B, can you please open? Okay. We have an inspection. What? Oh, oh you're coming too. Come and look. Everybody's seen look this. Look at my room. This is the standard right here. This is the standard. Wow. This is normal. Come and see my bags here. Like all Holy smokes. Yeah. After we arrive at base camp, we're there about a week acclimatizing and training, reviewing all of our technical mountaineering skills. And then we have our puja celebration with our Nepal Sherpa team where they honor the mountain and ask for safe passage. The puja ceremony is where the holy lamas come in and um, it's something that the, the Sherpa people, um, our guides, take very, very seriously. And we sit there for an hour and they chant and they bless. so much of an emphasis upon the blessing and that process so that we return safely to our family. The Kumbu Icefall is the first part of the route up from Everest Base Camp. And the Kumbu Icefall stretches about 2,000 feet. 
Now the ice fall is like a frozen river of ice coming down over a waterfall and breaking apart. The glacier, the frozen ice, comes down this 2,000 foot section and breaks apart. So there's big crevasses, there's ice towers, there's ice debris all over the place. And it moves about a meter a day. It takes about five hours to get through the Kumba Ice Fall, which is absolutely terrifying. Mark trained extremely hard for this climb, but everyone acclimatizes differently. I think for Mark, the altitude was tough, as it is for all of us. And it's something he really had to fight through and focus on up high on Everest. The first time I went up, you know, I was able to do that successfully, but we were gonna go up to camp one and stay and then come back down. And on the way back down, Mark slipped and fell and tumbled into a crevasse. I was right behind him, and so I hurried up and climbed down to where he was and where I could see him. Fortunately, I was tied in, so it stopped, or I would have kept going all the way down through a crevasse, but it was terrifying. I'm so blessed that I didn't break anything, but it just really made me, going forward, pay way more attention. When you get up into those elements, things always happen. And so what I need to do is be able to really dig back down into the things that motivate me and inspire me. Hey, Amelia, wave. That wave, really? I can barely ride this bike. I can't do <laughs> And I have two daughters, Claudette and Amelia. For you. You know what? Oh, actually, no, actually, I want to tell you when something. When are you going back? Hey, I want to know, are you ever going back to the University of Amelia yeah. has epilepsy. She's had it since she's eight years old. When I was first diagnosed with epilepsy, my dad, he did everything in his power to find what medications work. Is there a surgery we can do? A year and a half ago, it became mission critical where they went from small seizures to grand malls. I got a call at like midnight um, that she had had a grand mal seizure in, in Arizona where she goes to college and her face turned blue and you know she, her eyes rolled back in the back of her head. She was foaming in the mouth, she was bleeding. The last thing they saw was Amelia had fallen to the ground in her dorm and she was going to the hospital. When you're not there to protect her, when you're not there to really take that in and do something for her, and you don't know if she's gonna live or die, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. If my roommate had not walked out of the door and found me, I would have been dead within five minutes. After that, I said to myself, what's happening? What needs to change? I don't ever want this to happen again because that was the scariest moment of my life. See, here's the one, look. have a meeting with Kate. Great, but look, here's you. Through all that, she's battled back. And every single day, I wake up knowing this is the first day towards a better life. And most days, it's not always, but there are small signs of improvement. There's never gonna be the right time to do a great thing. She inspires me so much. I've developed a campaign around this with a group here in Sun Valley, Idaho called Higher Ground. And we developed a campaign called the Millions Everest, the Lotsi Challenge. And so the whole goal has been to, to climb these mountains, but also to try to get her healed by raising money and awareness towards this uh, organization. <laughs> I think the thing that touched Mark the most was just that, hey, look at, I can climb a mountain, which is a passion of mine, and at the same time, I can help others. Dad, I need you to. <laughs> I've loved seeing that out of him because it shows his depth. Going from this to be a singular journey for him to something that that brings more people in. 
and it shows the true spirit of who he is because he's been through a lot. He's had some real tough times and he's kind of gotten out of his own way and he's gotten into like back into the team. Climbing Everest for me and something I relate to our team is we need to break it down into a day-by-day event. It's so important to take care of our bodies as well to get proper nutrition and rest. So before our summit attempt, some members will go down to Namche at about 11,000 feet to rest and recover. Others will stay in base camp. At this point, we're finalizing all of our logistics, making sure the high camps are stocked with oxygen tents, food, fuel, and the route is in good shape, ready for us to climb. Hey, camp two, going to camp three. Fishing this. I underestimated the physical and the mental and the emotional strain that it took to actually pull this off. So we came up. We started with, I think, 19, 20 people in our group, and of the 20 people in the group, I think we had nine that quit um, for various reasons. Some were physical, some were mental, some were just, they had it. It's just a long time being deprived in every single way to be on a mountain. We had a lot of bad weather up on Mount Everest. We had a lot more bad weather than normal. After we got into Camp 3, a storm came, and the next day was whiteout, blizzard, wind, not a pleasant day. We were watching the weather forecast, and it looked like there might be a weather window around the 20th or 21st, so we moved up to Camp 4. Going across the yellow band right now. We're about what, two hours away from Camp Four. Uh, slow and steady, as they say this morning. Things change rapidly without supplemental oxygen in the death zone. So the danger is if you're moving too slow, you get stuck in a storm, or there's too many other climbers, you could run low on oxygen or run out of oxygen altogether. It's so hard. When we got to Camp 4, it was windy, and it was full-on survival mode. So we've been under intense windstorm. We had to consolidate with three people in a tent. It's very packed. Hoping to start climbing tonight. These winds die down. That's what it looks like. We were scheduled to get up at a certain time and uh, nobody woke us up. And so by the time that the guides had realized that our tent hadn't roused yet, we had about 20 minutes to get going. We left that night on May 22nd around midnight with the plan of summiting in the morning on May 23rd. There was about a 40 mile per hour wind blowing left to right. And I wasn't wearing any goggles at the time because it was pitch black and I wanted to be able to see. There were some gusts of wind that picked up snow and ice particles off the mountain and scratched his eyeballs. So unfortunately, I think his left eye uh, became affected and essentially was going blind. 
Not only was I hungry because I hadn't eaten breakfast, but now I had to deal with this uh, snow blindness. And um, that really kicked in when I got up to the Hillary Step. I spent 18 hours on the mountain, which is way too long. I miss like every deadline you're supposed to, to hit. I was struggling. Yeah, I could only go 10 feet at a time and I have to stop. I knew I had to tap into something else to get me motivated. Not only was I thinking about Amelia, but I was also thinking about my, my other daughter, Claudette. Especially with Amelia, with her epilepsy and her daily struggle. If she can go through this, then I can, I can keep pushing. Once I got to the top, a lot of people think that I'm at the pinnacle looking over the world. But I was, I was so worn out by that time that I had a really hard time enjoying the top. I'm wincing right now because it's really hard to see with the sun down. Still made the top. I have an amazing Sherpa. Oh, namaste. Basically helped wheel me up the mountain. I'm so thankful and grateful. And uh, as you can see, the playground is down, and uh, Nepal is amazing, it's beautiful. Coming off Mount Everest, back to high camp, might have been a turning point for Mark, in that his focus changed from wanting to go after another summit, Lhotse, to wanting to get home safely to his loved one. When I was coming down the other side, a lot of things came to me. The value of the people that I love, Lochi not becoming important, me breaking records being important. I knew that my end goal was not to die. My end goal was to continue to help others, to help my daughter. I would have loved to have climbed both those mountains, but I put my life in jeopardy. I'm really proud of him because it's really hard to go from a really low point in your life to being the happiest you've ever been. And I hope also that he understands that he's inspired other people without even realizing it. The mountains gave me clarity, but at the end of the day, the full healing, seeing my daughters, that's what matters. And you know, it's a wonderful feeling about what's, what's next and what's ahead.